Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to share some insights about innovation from our work and perhaps challenge some of your understandings as innovation as we know it. When we think about innovation, we often think about the lone experimenter, the scientist who's spending time alone by himself or herself, uh, waiting for that moment of eureka discovery. Well, as we look deeper into that, uh, really what happens with innovation, it's a much more network phenomena and it's about connections. A lot of my work comes from Dr. Andy Hargadon at UC Davis, with whom I run our Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And we're undertaking numerous studies of social sector innovation, that work that's happening at the intersection of business and government and nonprofits. And I'm gonna share some of those insights, as well as some of my insights from teaching social entrepreneurship at, at UC Berkeley. What we're finding, as you might expect, is that the process of innovation is so much less about the discovery, but more about the connections, the collaboration, the connections, often the unusual connections between people and institutions. Often, if you ask the people that we work with, the scientists and inventors within the university environment, we work with a lot of these smart folks, and we say collaborate, he or she'll work with others with the same skill set that look or act or have similar training to the way that he or she has. Well, what we're talking about when we're forming connections is finding those unusual partners, those people that can bring new insights and perspectives about how to do things. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on this from some historical examples, and then I'll bring it into the forward um, to the present day around social sector innovation. So this is probably one of the most important innovations of the last hundred years the commercialization of penicillin. And this gentleman here, Dr. Fleming, is often credited with being the inventor of penicillin. But when you look more closely at the history of this discovery, we've actually known about penicillin for about 2,000 years. It goes back to when Persians would use this, uh, the moldy bread, and put it on wounds to, to slow down infection. So the idea of discovering penicillin is almost absurd. We've known about it for a very long time. The real history of, of, um, of penicillin is this man, and he, and he um, uh, Dr. Flory, brought penicillin and brought it to scale and took it from a lab experiment and brought it to uh, basically where in five years it was, we were producing billions of doses of penicillin uh, in, in a very short amount of time. And the question really is, how did that happen? And it's a network building phenomena. If you look at, at Flory's connections, uh, he took his work, that the, some of the work that had priorly done with Alexander Fleming, and brought it outside of Oxford, brought it to the United States, brought it to national labs with pharma companies, many others built out a very diverse network that could scale and take that innovation to a place that could be a transformative and, and truly innovative uh, product. Whereas Fleming saw the initial work really as very much a lab experiment and kept it within the lab. And so the real you know, innovation was not the discovery, it was the scaling and building out of the partnerships. We see this in so many historical examples of innovation. The light bulb wasn't invented by Edison. We knew that the technology had existed for about 50 years before he so-called invented it. What his innovation was, was building out the network that could support it and make it endure for so long. Even the, the assembly line from Ford, he didn't invent it. Uh, he took the ideas and recombined them from the disassembly plants at the time, the slaughterhouses, and learned and recombined to, to, to discover the idea of, of the assembly line. There's a little theory behind this that's important for us as social sector leaders, and this comes from the work of Ronald Burt around strong ties and weak ties. Burt talks about strong ties as those people and those organizations that you know well, and those are important for innovation, for sure, but more importantly are those weak ties, those ties to 
bodies of knowledge, to institutions, to organizations that will give you insight into whole other ways of thinking. They'll help you learn what you don't know you don't know. And the most innovative companies, organizations, foundations, nonprofits have many weak ties to other bodies of knowledge that truly is transformative in, in the work that's done. To ground this in some examples, locally and internationally, one of the great organizations that does this so well is here is Delancey Street Foundation. And this is Mimi Silbert, who for almost 40 years has taken this her approach in working with her population. She works with uh, ex-cons, with drug addicts, and, and truly a social change model that wasn't based on a lot of the traditional structures. And she used social, social enterprise before it was even popular. She built a world-class moving company where you had ex-cons moving stuff safely. She runs restaurants, uh, all sorts of businesses, and has brought her um, target, target population into whole new opportunities and whole new networks. Another organization right here in San Francisco that's uh, an, an amazing, one of our study sites, are the National Park Units. This is a Presidio, which was uh, in the country's, um, as, a, as a military base, for over 200 years. And then in 1992, Congress wanted to sell it. And uh, there was a huge community outcry. And this forced a whole level of thinking in terms of how you could preserve a place that has so many historic and natural and cultural resources. And the idea was to create a self-sustaining national park. And this required a whole different level of connectivity between the government, between business, between the real estate industry, between the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors. And the results have been astounding, as you can see if you uh, look outside the windows. I'd like to distill this down to a couple of key points that we found from our research. Really the first one is around helping support and build connections throughout our communities. One of the great organizations that we were looking at on this, that's doing this extremely well, is the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. Their work, their mission is to connect the leaders of the sustainability movement across our largest cities and, and uh, in North America, uh, United States and Canada primarily. And they took this network building approach and they wanted to expand the impact and innovation of the cities. And they consciously built ties among their members and connected them with one another and with very diverse cities with very diverse interests. And over a five year time increased the number of ties from an average of eight to almost 40. And the results have been stunning in terms of collaboration and innovation in some of the areas that most need innovation in sustainability. Another principle, the second principle I'd like to talk about is helping people move to action. Many people think that ideas progress linearly over time. And many in our community like to think about things and they wanna think about it more and they wanna think about it more. And what the real value in innovation, it's a stepwise progression. And the way that the progression, the ideas progress in value is by reducing the uncertainty. And really the only way to reduce that uncertainty is to do. It's a process of thinking and doing and iterating and learning from your mistakes. One of the great examples in the, this area in, in social impact that's done this is Revolution Foods. This was founded by two MBAs from Berkeley that wanted to change the quality of food served in our nation's schools. They didn't know a lot about food systems or school systems, but they were passionate about making an impact. And they formed some very unusual partnerships with Whole Foods, with charter schools, with many in the community that they learned and they prototyped. They would literally buy small quantities of food from Whole Foods in the middle of the night and drive it to to charter schools in the morning. And they learned a lot in that way, much more than um, years of business planning or years of writing would do. They learned what kids like to eat. They learned what communities need. They need, learned what the schools want and need and what it's like to partner with large corporations. Now in, in less than 10 years, they now have over a thousand employees and are serving millions of healthy lunches across America. This probably wouldn't have been possible if they had just continued to think about it rather than take action and learn. 
The final big point here is around bringing in unusual partners. One of our study sites is looking at the California energy market. And we often hear this rhetoric about government stifling innovation. And that's not what we're finding. We're finding that government can be a huge source of innovation. This is a graph of energy usage per capita comparing the United States as a whole and California. And over the, roughly the last 40 years, the per capita energy use in California has remained constant, whereas in the United States as a whole, it's doubled or tripled, which makes sense in some ways uh, that it would, it would increase. Um, what doesn't make sense logically is it will remain the same given the proliferation of electronic devices. And that's been very consciously a policy decision, but also bringing in industry and environmental nonprofits to drive innovation in energy and, and lighting. We particularly study the residential lighting market. There's a lot of information on the slide. And two points, though, to take from the slide, I think, are, of course, the declining cost curve of this technology, LEDs. But perhaps maybe more interesting, because that's, that's a typical cost curve decline, what's more interesting are those companies that innovated those. Probably not many of you have heard of those companies. They're not the typical players in the lighting or energy market. And that's what's interesting. This drive towards energy efficiency of high quality lighting has opened the market to a whole lot of new players that are producing high quality light that's dramatically uh, reducing the energy and the environmental impacts. And this would not have been possible by government, industry, or nonprofits working alone. But this connectivity with some very unusual partners has uh, had a tremendous impact in this lighting. We're going to see this for, for years to come here in California. In summary, I just would like to come back to the key points that I think are so important for social sector leaders to focus on, which is around ab abandoning this idea, this myth of the lone innovator, helping build and support communities, helping people move to action, and considering very unlikely partners. It's been a pleasure to speak with you all today. I would love to continue this conversation. Here's my contact information, and thank you again. Thank you.